So the question becomes, how do you actually study trade without trade goods? Well, lucky for us, there was a substance that was found at the site that while it wasn't traded directly itself, was probably used as a packaging material for the trade goods. And what I'm talking about is this natural petroleum asphalt or tar that bubbles up from the ground uh, in certain areas of the Middle East and um, is called bitumen and is was used for a, a wide variety of things. So this is a place in Iraq, uh, not too far from Baghdad, called Heat, H-I-T. And you can see the black petroleum tar just bubbling up from the ground. You can, you know, ancient people and people today scoop it up and use it for all sorts of things, uh, just like they did back in ancient uh, Mesopotamia. It's a little bit like the La Brea tar pits in California. Uh, here's another bitumen seep. Now, the, the Middle East is rich in petroleum in certain areas. You know, everyone knows this. Uh, and in some of those areas, the petroleum will actually, the dense part of the petroleum will bubble up to the surface. So at a place like Heat or near Kirkuk, they actually had uh, natural asphalt. Now, what did the ancient Mesopotamians use this for? Well, they used it for all sorts of things. Uh, they used it for pigment for the wall cones. They used it to glue sickle blades into handles. They used it for art objects, like we saw this uh, king figure. They used it to waterproof pottery and also other things like boats. They used it, um, as you can see, on probably, we think, packaging, uh, like reed um, mats or reed baskets. So here is a reed um, place, you know, a sort of a reed mat that was covered with bitumen. The reed is gone, but you can still see the impressions of it. Here's a bevel rim bowl with bitumen. Maybe they were using that to scoop out some of the liquid bitumen. This, you can see the basketry impression. So it was probably used to waterproof a basket that may have contained some trade goods. Uh, here you can see a sickle blade. These are all from Haji Nebi. Now, <clears throat> each seep in the Middle East is a little bit different chemically, which meant that if I studied the artifacts, I might be able to figure out where they came from. A lot of the artifacts were found in this particular part of the site, which is near the entrance. To me, that's not too surprising because a lot of um, trade and a lot of uh, mercantile activity would occur near the entrances to sites. This is a piece of bitumen where you still have a little bit of the reed attached to it. So I thought that there were different functions for the bitumen. Some of it was packaging, some of it was used for waterproofing. And some of it was used for sort of everyday utilitarian functions. So what I did is I, I analyzed some of these artifacts chemically. And this is, you know, looks like a complicated um, diagram. Um, and I won't get into too much detail. But what I'll point out is based on my analysis, and this is material from southern Mesopotamia. This is material from the site of Haji Nebi associated with a rook Mesopotamian pottery. I was able to correlate and source back some of this Mesopotamian bitumen back to southern Mesopotamia. And this was one of the uh, earliest uh, times in studying the Rook expansion that someone was able to conclusively prove that a good was definitely traded from southern Mesopotamia. Uh, that is, you know, some pottery is not actually a good item to trade. So it's not, uh, it would not be unheard of that some of those Mesopotamian pots were actually made from local clays by Mesopotamians themselves. Um, you know, we said bulky things are not good things to trade. Um, there's no textiles, so you can't source those. But the fact that we had this bitumen and that we know it came from southern Mesopotamia shows that there really was trade going on. Um, what about the question of were there Mesopotamians there? Uh, you know, someone might say, again, still, okay, maybe they traded bitumen up there, but people didn't actually go up there. There weren't any Mesopotamians there. 
Well, my advisor, Gil Stein, was a zooarchaeologist. He studied animal bones, a little bit like Professor Arnold in our department. So what he did is he took all the animal bones that were associated with local Anatolian pottery at the site of Hajinebi, and he took all the animal bones that were associated with Mesopotamian pottery at the site, and he compared the two. Now, you can already see that there's a difference here. The Mesopotamian part of the site, there's a huge prevalence of sheep and goat, and not much pig or cattle. And that's different from the local areas. Now, what is uh, important about this is that these dietary preferences that we think we see here with, associated with Mesopotamian pottery are the same dietary preferences that you see in southern Mesopotamia. So what that means is that the, the people who are living at the site with Mesopotamian material culture are eating the same proportions of foods and the same proportions of animals as they would back in southern Mesopotamia. Because food preferences are seen by many people as sort of an unconscious thing, right? That is, you know, maybe they didn't grow up eating a lot of pig and they didn't really like it. And maybe locals loved eating pig. Um, that this might show that Mesopotamians really were living at the site. One of the artifacts I thought was really interesting that I worked with was this very large piece of bitumen you can see here. Uh, it had these impressions on it. So to get a better look at the impressions, I used some latex and pulled it off of the artifact. And what I saw were these reeds tied by rope that were then tied to each other, large reed bundles that were then waterproofed. And I was pretty convinced that what this piece was was part of a waterproofing for a boat which makes, again, a lot of sense. And this is from the pre-contact period. So locals were already building boats to uh, send things downstream right, to other areas. And of course, I'm sure this uh, increased when Mesopotamians were there. Uh, these kind of reed boats can still be found in the marshes in southern Mesopotamia. And as you can see from these Arook period seals, they were making those kinds of reed boats at that time period as well. This is a later depiction from the Assyrian Empire. All right, so what happened to the Rook expansion? Well, it, it seems to have disappeared suddenly. A lot of those sites like Hajinebi, Habuba, Kabir, Jebel, Ruda were abandoned very suddenly. Uh, we don't know exactly what was going on. That's still a question that archaeologists are trying to answer. Um, did, did trade dry up completely in southern Mesopotamia? No. Copper, stone, things like that are still making their way to southern Mesopotamia. So they're obviously coming through a different mechanism. We're still unsure as to how uh, that was occurring. So there's still unanswered questions about the Rook expansion, but certainly we know more about it uh, than we did previously. From my work, there also seems to have been a difference between the middle Rook period and the later Rook period. Uh, it looks like during the middle of Rook period, a lot of those sites, um, like Hajinebi, were built mainly for trade. In the later Rook period, sites like Abuba Kabira seem to have been more focused on settlement than trade. But again, that is a point of debate. Okay, so let's look at the formation of the state. One of the readings that you have this week uh, looks at state formation in Mesopotamia very much in a Marxist perspective. And we'll talk a little bit about this. But let's look at some of the theories that have already, you know, that some of these large-scale theories that we saw to explain the state in general and see how they apply to Mesopotamia. Carnero's theory dealt with warfare. Um, now, there's not a large amount of warfare during the Uruk period. It increases later on. There's also nothing really to compete with a rook. So if people were fleeing to a rook for safety, it's not exactly clear who they were fleeing from because there was no other power like the city of a rook. So it doesn't seem that the state in Mesopotamia formed because of conflict over resources between large villages. Um, you just you don't have that. You have really one mega super city. Uh, so what about Wittfogel's idea with irrigation? Well, like we talked about before, the irrigation in the Uruk period is local scale. 
it doesn't look like it was coordinated by the top. It looks like it's done by groups, small groups, who are coordinating it. And it's only much later, after the state's already in place, that you have the coordination of large-scale irrigation works. So, in terms of Mesopotamia, Wittfogel got it backwards, or at least his idea doesn't really apply. Uh, the state comes first in Mesopotamia, large-scale irrigation comes later, right? And just to be clear, we're talking about large-scale irrigation that requires the state to organize it. We're not talking about all irrigation. You need irrigation in southern Mesopotamia to grow crops. You cannot survive without irrigation. Okay, um, we'll talk about some of the Marxist theories, Flannery's theory. It sort of applies to everything because it's multi-causal. Okay, um, archaeologists like Nissen say that the irrigation problem also has another um, facet to it that's, that shows that it's not really quite correct uh, because when they did climate reconstruction, it turns, out, it, it turns out that during the Uruk period, it was weather in southern Mesopotamia uh, than it was later on in other periods. Uh, the river level drops in periods later on, like the early dynastic. So irrigation wouldn't have been so crucial in the Uruk period anyway. Okay, let's look at the sort of synthetic model. Uh, Gil Stein sort of was proposed a little bit of this idea, as well as a guy named Robert McCormick Adams. And what they thought is that the temples and the city was kind of like an adaptation to the environment. So it's almost like a, thinking of it in terms of evolution. You know, there's kind of a, a new thing. We, in, in nature, we call it a mutation. It might give a selective advantage to that organism, in this case, a society. It, uh, because it has an advantage, it's selected for, and it's able to reproduce itself. So what they were, you know, that's sort of a, a oversimplified way of putting it. But what they were basically saying is that uh, Mesopotamia might be, you know, seems to be an area where there's a lot of flux and fluctuation in the environment. You could have a bad harvest. Uh, storage uh, and centralized storage by the temple uh, allowed for sort of a backup uh, for the community if things went wrong. So it's almost like, um, you know, big, what we think of big government today dealing with a natural disaster. Think, you know, some of the natural disasters that have occurred recently and, you know, a, a federal res response is required in order to help people out. Uh, and so people were willing to give tribute to the temple because they knew that the temple was kind of their backup if things went wrong. So it's almost like paying into a system and paying into a quote-unquote bank uh, and this allowed for the temples to become more and more powerful. And people would go to the city because they felt, okay, these villages, you know, if something goes wrong in the village, there's nothing we can do. We'll starve. If we go to the city, at least we know if there's a bad harvest, you know, the temple will take care of us. So that's one idea. And it's almost kind of the opposite of the Marxist approach in, in some ways, because it's saying that, the elites are there to kind of serve people. The state is a way to benefit the overall population. Whereas a Marxist would say the state is really created to serve the, um, serve the needs of only the elites and the leaders. Now, Guillermo Algaze thinks very strongly, no big surprise, that trade was the driving force uh, be, in the formation of the state in Mesopotamia, and that the need to have these items like metals and stone and wood necessitated organization, because in order to trade over long distances, you had to organize, you had to produce something, you had to organize merchants to go to other areas and get these goods, and that necessitated better administration, better management, better organization, and led to the state. And there might be something to that in Mesopotamia. Another archaeologist, similar to the uh, 
Adams and, and Stein model, although he went even further and he kind of classified Mesopotamia as a welfare state. Um, but there's um, no evidence that temples actually own the land. We know that temples were getting surplus uh, from people, but there's no uh, evidence that the state, you know, if you think of it as a temple state, there's no evidence that the temple is actually the owner of the land. All right. Susan Pollack uh, believes counter to this that the temples did not own the land, but it was a tribute system. Houses were independent, but they were motivated to uh, grow surplus crops and give that surplus crop, those surplus crops to the, the temple. And we know about some of the ordinary houses and residences in areas outside of Uruk, but we don't know about the ordinary houses and residences in the city itself. And that's something that archaeologists will hopefully look at in the future. Now, Livrani, who you're reading this week, thinks uh, very strongly that ideology was created, this ideology of the gods, and that people are put on earth to serve the gods, uh, and that the temples and the priests are the emissaries of the gods on earth, and that this was kind of uh, created as a way for uh, the leaders to cement their position in the society, right? uh, cement their power, um, and also, you know, give them sort of a, a way to control uh, the population. So that he, he very much has kind of a Marxist idea. So which one is correct? Well, it's hard to say. Uh, we know that certain ideas like Wittfogel and Carnero's idea don't seem to work for Mesopotamia. Um, and so we still have yet to narrow down some of these other ideas and figure out which one seems to be uh, or which combination of these seem to be, because obviously, as systems theory says, it could be more than one, which combination of these ideas explains the formation of the state in Mesopotamia. So further work in northern Mesopotamia and areas of Syria have changed the story in terms of the Uruk expansion uh, and the Uruk period even more. Uh, because remember, you know, in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, Al Ghazi was saying that uh, southern Mesopotamia was this core, was far more developed than other places, uh, you know, in the Middle East was more developed than northern Mesopotamia or Anatolia. Well, excavations on sites like Tel Brak have kind of changed the story. And you did a little reading about uh, this north versus south Mesopotamian style. Uh, because what they found at Tel Brak is that Tel Brak was becoming a very large site and may have even reached what we would call an urban site. It would become a city several hundred years before a rook. So it, some people believe that the evidence shows that urbanism and cities actually began first in northern Mesopotamia, not in southern Mesopotamia. Further sort of showing that this idea that southern Mesopotamia is the more developed and northern Mesopotamia is the less developed is just not accurate. Now there's some debate about this, but if Tel Brak was a city, it was not a city exactly like Uruk. It was less dense in terms of the population. The population seems to be more spread out. These little trailways show the extent to where people were living. It looks like people lived close to, tel to the site and then over time slowly started to move closer and closer uh, to the center of the site, and it became, you know, larger and larger. And we're talking about maybe 3900 BC uh, is when it becomes basically a city. So several hundred years before Uruk, it starts growing by around 4200 uh, BC. All right, so it looks almost like um, suburbs around kind of a core, and some people think of it almost like a Mayan city. If you've taken 
uh, Anthropology 215, Origins of Civilization, you might have learned about the Mayan cities. Uh, Mayan cities typically had a central area with a few thousand people where the king lived and the elites and the nobility, and then lots of people in small villages close by around the city center. Uh, and that's might have been what was going on with Tel Brock. But even before any contact with southern Mesopotamia, we see that Tel Brock was a complex society. Uh, there was lots of craft specialization going on. They found lots of workshops. Uh, they found a temple dedicated specifically to uh, worship a, a local deity of some sort. We'll, we'll see pictures of that. But also, as it was growing and becoming larger and larger, there's evidence for conflict. Uh, it's not necessarily warfare because it could have been done by, it could have been internal violence between groups. That's what some archaeologists believe, that as Tel Brock was becoming larger and larger, there, were, there was friction and schism between different groups who had to live together in this city. And some of these groups might have fought with each other, uh, you know, and killed each other. Uh, you know, on mass, this burial had 70 people in it uh, between the ages of 20 and 45 uh, years of age. Uh, and they all show evidence of trauma or violence, and they were all thrown into this large pit. This is not a neat cemetery. This was a mass uh, burial. And so with increased urbanization, at least in northern Mesopotamia, there might have been more internal conflict and there was a result, a result uh, more violence within the community. That's one idea. Um, now, they found a temple. This was actually Max Malouan uh, with Agatha Christie found a temple. He called the Eye Temple because uh, throughout Tel Brak and also in the temple itself, were these kind of figurines with these kind of eyes. No one knows exactly what they represent. Of course, uh, I'm sure some people would say aliens, right? Um, but, or you know, if they even represent eyes at all, or if they represent something different, we're not entirely sure, but it's definitely a Northern Mesopotamian thing because you don't find it in Southern Mesopotamia. And this was the quote unquote, I idol temple. Uh, that Malouin found. We also find lots of evidence of trade. So they're getting semi-precious stones here uh, at uh, at the site. They this is something I forgot to mention. They have obsidian that they're um, trading for. Uh, this is some sort of elite drinking vessel. This was an obsidian goblet. It was carved on the inside. Here's that bitumen stuff glued to this base with bitumen. And this would have been a drinking vessel. And this here is a seal impression. So again, evidence of seals, evidence of crafts, evidence of prestige goods, evidence of a larger and larger site. It you know it um, based on the evidence you can make the a strong case that Tel Brock uh, became a city before southern Mesopotamia. It never got quite as large as a rook did, but it reached a size that we would say is a city before uh, the sites in, Mes in southern Mesopotamia. Now, at a certain point, there's some burning at the site. Uh, and after the level of destruction of burning, you have southern Mesopotamian artifacts on top of that level. And some people believe that southern Mesopotamians attacked ancient Tel Brak and conquered it, maybe, or, or, or defeated it in battle, and then set up a colony on top of those uh, burned ruins. That's one interpretation. And it's not outlandish because at a very nearby site called Hamukar, was also a northern Mesopotamian site that de was developing on its own. Here you can see a stamp seal. This site is decorated. The other side has the impressions that would be pushed into clay. But this site is decorated with two kissing bears, you can see. Here's Tel Brak. Here's Hamukar. Now, 
at Hamukar around the same time, around 3500 BC, a little bit later, um, there's evidence of destruction, burning, warfare, it looks like possibly, and then southern Mesopotamian artifacts. Uh, the archaeologist, you can see him here, Clemens Reichel, uh, who was one of the directors, and Syrian archaeologist, who was the co-director, uh, found uh, right near a Uruk period wall lots of these objects made of clay. And it looks like these are sling bullets made from clay. And he thinks, or they think, I should say, that uh, the southern Mesopotamians attacked this site. They ran out of ammunition. They started using local clay. And they were th throwing these at the walls and the people on the walls you know, with their slings. And some of these had not dried completely. And you can see it's kind of the Hershey Kiss shape here. Some of these hit the wall and kind of made this flattened shape. Um, and this was right near that wall that burned. He found, you know, they found hundreds of these sling bullets right at the base of the wall. So it looks like, you know, according to, to the archaeologists there, that southern Mesopotamians attacked the site, defeated the site, and then set up a colony on top of the destroyed area of the site. So there's still important questions to answer, right? Uh, what came first? Did the north develop urbanism first? Did the south develop urbanism first? Um, well, we don't know, but it could have been the north. It seems like the north did develop uh, into cities first. Um, and what this does, you know, and people have pointed this out to Guillermo Algaze and said, look, you know, your model doesn't work because not only is Southern Mesopotamia not the core, but they weren't even the first ones to develop cities. The North is developing cities first. Um, and so you can't really use this world system idea. Now he would counter it and say, okay, maybe they came first, but which culture eventually became the dominant one, right? That is, he would say, you know, Telbrak and Hamukar attacked by Southern Mesopotamia and defeated. Um, the writing system, as we're going to talk about this week, beginnings of the writing system, it develops in Southern Mesopotamia and then is adopted by cultures in the North. So he believes he's not entirely incorrect because the Southern Mesopotamia still grows larger than northern Mesopotamia. There's more of an unbroken development, as we'll see, in southern Mesopotamia. Um, and so it may not act and by a hundred a few hundred years, it may not be the first, but it did become the more dominant culture in the area. So again, there's still a lot of debate. This is what makes archaeology fun for many people. People like the the debate, they like to be able to look at things that don't necessarily have a, a, a clear answer to them. Uh, to some people, this is just really frustrating, and they may not like archaeology that much as a result. Well, now we're going to look at the development of writing during the Uruk period, because the Uruk period is where we start to see the appearance of writing and how it develops. So we're going to see how writing first appears in Mesopotamia, a little bit of how it develops. And then following weeks, we'll be talking about the writing system and also reading some of the ancient texts of Mesopotamia.